in the early 19th century, showing the place with water, but the, that was never done. Ross, we did simple. Our aim is that it's difficult to maintain public garden. This one is terribly visited. And so we wanted to, to make things simple but existing, but in a very light way. That's still the same work. Actually, those bosques were also with sort of soft borders and we found that it was quite important to keep some higher level of grass because in the distance you can see it on the other bus on the other side of the axis it grab the reading of the sand of these huge alleys which are in the garden uh, sorry that was for Stinko's work which is uh, which are the, some of the the buvette that was uh, made last year and it's not finished as you can, I mean it is finished now but I don't have the picture. This is the, the um, uh, one of the bosques which has been used for the children as a playground and all this funny strange shape lower in the center is filled with simply um, euonymus but they can walk and go into tunnels underneath shrubs there is sort of room at the beginning here. And that's uh, also on the back to the Jutpum place. We did some very thick um, hedges in a, a very formal design that you can see <coughs> on the plan that goes along the, <coughs> the facade of the Jutpum. And um, I'm going to, to finish by the sort of color sp scheme we chose when we were there, working there on the site, using very bright colors. The first year were more soft, and actually it was not really holding the space, and that's very important in such a big place to use things which are in a sort of vulgar way, but readable. There is also a funny detail there, is that we replanted a few informal trees in, in the uh, uh, pleached um, horse chestnut at the end of the Grand Carré, so that from the terrace you could imagine them being in front of that and keeping this informal look that the Grand Carré has kept. That was, in, that was five years ago, one of the schemes which was very bright, but working well. And that's the end of that. Maybe I should, um, what am I doing? <laughs> yes, I want to finish by the, the Wirt's work. Um, that's the result of what he has been doing in the Cour du Carousel. Um, there is some rays. I think that from that part of the garden, the accelerated perspective Going to the Arc de Triomphe is interesting. The plan he did was from the Arc de Triomphe, there is five, seven rays of views uh, placed to the garden in a very symbolic way. And um, there is two sort of ziggurat of views and, and lime on both sides of the existing horse chestnut you can see creating a barrier from the rond-point made by Pei, just behind and in front of the pyramid, and also um, creating a barrier to the garden. And that's it, and I'm waiting for your questions. First of all, the, the garden was, um, uh, it was, as you saw, absolutely necessary to redo. 
the general um, Pierre Antoine, who is here, knows that this sort of place is typically in Chasse Gardée for the uh, architect des Monuments Historiques. And the idea of, first of all, of pay being chosen for the Louvre was to go on with some a sort of new ideas. But new ideas were possible in that place because the planes had changed a lot, as you saw. And the Rue de Rivoli was not there when Le Nôtre has been building the garden. The palace was not there anymore. And also the function had evolved. So recreating or doing a restoration was rather difficult. The, that's the intellectual part of it. The practical part of it is that five hectare of boxes to be clipped is an enormous amount of work. Um, it was not going to be seen from that palace which had disappeared. And um, all the pattern, the, six, the, seven, the 16 uh, bosquets were planted uh, mainly with horse chestnuts, as you saw, that no one wanted to take the decision, which could have been a good decision, to cut down all the trees. And, but they were planted on, uh, in a place which was the uh, second, second Empire place, because the way the, the planting has been renewed in the garden and that was without any archaeological uh, precision. But because some of the 18th century trees were still there and they were not in the same alignment as the one we found. So you know that none of the trees were planted at the same place. But as far as we were not, that no one was wishing us to cut down all the trees, we had to replant in the trees. So we kept exactly the same design. The, what, what we did was to change some of the species where it was possible, um, like one of the vertical axes, which is out of, made out uh, with Tilia Cordata, one of the main alley on the Esplanade de Feuillon, uh, just ordinary uh, Acer Platanoides. We kept the horse chestnuts in the previous alignment, but the way we worked was to try to do some complete alignment Actually, all the bosques are built with three rows of trees. And so we worked with bigger trees in the Rang Intermediaire and with newer, younger trees on the outside where they had more light. And um, we have been replanted 3,000 trees there, which is a, a rather big amount of trees. But I don't, I hope that people walking the garden don't have the feeling that we change their garden on the mature aspect. But we took down even some good trees to be, to allow ourselves to replant younger trees, being able to grow. Because also the, the spacing in between trees is very narrow, it was very narrow. Yes, that's the political side of it. That's very Mitterrand-like. Um, André Biasini was in charge of the Grand Travaux. Jacques Lang was mad because the Grand Travaux were not in his pocket. Um, Mitterrand has always been placing two persons working in the same place um, for the same thing. Jacques Lang actually to grab back the Tuileries Garden out of Biazini's work on the Louvre or on the Grand Arche or whatever it is. And um, the way we were chosen has been uh, nine person were, nine group of people were chosen for the competition. And an American, Michael van Valkenburg, Jacques Wirtz, a Belgium, and the other six teams, uh, seven teams were French. And if we were chosen, it's maybe because we were young, French, but so young that um, without any experience of bigger gardens, that um, the decision was to give us a father behind us. And it was told to Jacques Wirst that he had to look at our work. And so that 
we had some sort of terrible confusions and terrible rows and very sad things together. <laughs> but we didn't want it. When he was working on his carousel part, he was always coming with plans for the Grand Carré, following it. And um, we had, I mean, it, 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 it was quite difficult politically. <laughs> Uh, the gra for uh, no one wanted any trees to be cut down, and when we took down some trees from the Jardin Réservé, a certain number of trees were allowed to be cut down. We had all the commission you can guess on us, agricultural, environment, everything uh, Mark has been talking about yesterday, plus the president, and I did something which was <laughs> who hated the, the idea of changing, actually, the garden. He wished it to be kept in a second empire way. But um, we took down more trees than we were allowed to. <laughs> and no, no one, no, everybody was informed that we were going to take down, let's say, uh, 26 trees. And we, I was there with the people cutting them. <laughs> no, but some, some of them were really badly placed. <laughs> and the mixture, you can't read it, but there, we had some views which were really uh, obtrusive to some views, but in a good state. Because the way we were allowed to take down some trees was just the phytosanitary point of view. And I had a phytosanitary commission with me and the deal were totally dishonest. And um, so, because I kept a few trees which were in a very bad state, knowing that they would fall, fall down. Actually, they are not anymore there <laughs> by themselves. But um, it, it, all that was a, a pure mess, very French, I can tell you. <laughs> No, we replanted some trees, and we wanted, in the, in the competition project, this, we designed the place without anything, but wishing it to be more free in between two formal spaces. And we designed, in, in the initial pro project, a sort of parterre in the Cour du Carousel, and that's why, actually, Jacques Verst was asked to do something which was really designed. And what we wished was a sort of more free space in between two design spaces. And, um, but keeping the idea of sequences, changing sequences like in a French garden, and, uh, but with some um, newer ideas. And actually, what you can't see is that we planted, and it's a very difficult thing in France again, because on the maintenance point of view, none of the gardeners knows how to deal with herbaceous plants. But there is some herbaceous plants in those bedding, in, in those beds, which are mixed, which are actually simply in lines. So they can still do their little rows in a simple way. But the, the fact was to try to create something which was happy and, and, and free and not going especially to an historical state. And if we kept the trees, it was because actually if we hope that there is some wonderful surface, for example, and we planted some on all the five hectares, but the main thing was to get a coherence with what we had. And um, the fact of having a few informal trees, the propos in that place is not to have interesting things. Um, compared to the rather poor um, variety, I mean, the small amount of different plants you have in that place, but to have um, something with flowers, P people are really keen on flowers, so we placed some flowering trees, we added some um, cadastris lutea and some magnolias, and again some cercis, but keeping that state, some of the trees are going to live for, I hope, of the previous generation for a, a long time. And it was rather sad just to take them off. The main thing 
was not the result of a style and of an empty space, which would be quite unhuman, because five hectares is big. But having it in, in, treated in, a, in a current, treated in a current way, we were not wishing to, to get down the trees. <coughs> yes? Who, who owns the garden and who maintains it? Um, the state owns it, so it means that it's the Ministère de la Culture who looks after it, and the way it's uh, géré, is, was the Louvre at the beginning, l'établissement public building the thing. The question was, would the garden would be looked after by the new établissement public of the Louvre, but actually it's La Caisse des Monuments Historiques which is looking after the garden, and the way it's maintained is by some uh, jardinier functionnaire, as in Saint-Cloud. How many of them? Fourteen. Oh, you're nasty. <laughs> 79. <laughs> 79. On the same amount of space. <coughs> but in both cases, it's not an example because um, there is two hectares of, of lawn to be mown in the Tuileries. I suppose that Courance has much more. Um, there is two important times of the year, which is the changing of the bedding plants, but most of the important works are made by firms, like the spraying, for, we have plenty of phytosanitary problems with bugs, and so firms are working, doing the, the bleaching. Um, there is another private thing, cleaning the papers and uh, that side of the garden, and so actually the gardeners had more work than the fact that the garden was new. We, didn't, we installed some um, automatic irrigation, but not for the trees. So the first year had to be watered by hand. So it gave them more work. But in my view, and I'm hated saying that by them, but I think that we could, I mean, they could be less if they were working more in a better way. Plenty of things were published, but not under our control, I would say. And um, no, when I'm saying that, it seems to be nasty, but <laughs> most of the things which were written were not really nice, I can tell you. We had plenty of fights for the statuary. All that is, again, very French and very complicated. Mitterrand knew very well the garden because, as you know, as you might know, he had a daughter with Anne Pinjot, and Anne Pinjot uh, wrote years ago a book on the saturday of the garden, and she knew it perfectly well. And so he knew, I mean, he was a very terriblement cultivé <laughs> man, but with a very historical an intellectual view of the site. And um, actually it was uh, very difficult to explain him what we were wishing to do. And it's just by walking and explaining him to the eyes, the levels of the, the wheel of the car on the previous Le Meunier Street, which were still above the tunnel existing, that we could lower the garden and re redo something with strong sequences and strong differences. And um, also he agreed that we moved a few statues, but at the be very beginning it was terribly difficult. And the result of the statuary today is that to our eyes we have too many statues and some were recently, I'm not talking about it because I, I didn't really follow the project, but there is some contemporary supposed contemporary modern statues being installed in the garden instead of some of the others, but in a very formal way. And um, what could have been interesting was to play some statues in a, first of all, with a scale which was possible for that type of garden, and uh, in a way which was related to the 
the way statuary was used in, in gardens. Um, but to make a real not 20th century act in a different way as they were placed previously, but sadly they are occupying the center of one of the bosques exactly like in any square. No, it isn't. We saw some pictures of Mayol because they were, during the work in the Cour de Carousel, where they were placed by Mayol, they were sent to the older garden, but they have been replaced uh, with Dina Vierni in the Cour de Carousel and are now in between those rows of views. Yes, always. Attempting to simplify it, so it was a more, it coordinated better with the pay period behind, and that the whole thing therefore became a modernized version of the Lenotre concepts, using his sort of geometrical approach, but with a greater, much greater simplification in the layout of the actual beds and the, the general plan. Is that what you had in mind, or did you have another? No, geometrical is the word that you have to use in such a place. Even Le Fuel design was geometrical. But we wanted to be in the way that we thought that Le Note worked. Uh, there is plenty of s details which are which I'm unable to take in picture, but actually all the grasses parts, which were the parterre, are bigger than in his initial plan. So re we reduced the alleys for one reason is that on a perspective point of view, when you are in the Bosque, in the main alleys going to the, to the garden, you can see the grass coming into the rows of trees. And so it gives you more appreciation of distance. And this is the thing Lenot was so good at doing. And um, the way he has been reversing the garden allowed us to send back those pools again to the garden, which was not the case before. That's the way we, we worked. And also the, the leveling uh, was terribly important to Lenot. Maybe that was no one has been really talking because we don't have any, uh, we have very little on the way he worked. We know the context historically, we know who was Vauban, who was Nisron, we know plenty of things, but not exactly the way he, he really worked. The thing is that he was paying a lot of attention when you go to, to so or places like that to the level. So we tried to find some answers to that place to make it more garden but in a way which could have been borrowed to his work the way that again the grass is higher than the level of the sand even if it's reduced visually it is terribly reduced in the distance uh, we worked in asymmetrical ways because if Le Nôtre's order symmetry is a very bad word for him all the bosques actually are different size along the, the main axis, but you don't see it. And, um, and the, the previous design of the garden was absolutely a nonsense with a ditch which, was, which had to be kept, because apart from Mitterrand's eyes, no one would have been strong enough to say, yes, we fill it back. And Actually, um, and the fact of the, the palace not being there anymore, I mean, they, they had no connection with the Saint Croix de Saint-André design. You must have faced one of the most difficult public relations exercises ever. Yes, I learned, a, I think I learned a lot. <laughs> Yes, but it was not spelled, I mean, again, the story is very long to tell, but um, one of his advisors, called Maxime de Langlard, was totally anti 
us. And so we, we were chosen, I don't know how, but we were chosen, and a year after, we worked, and so when I think we were chosen, Pei, Wirtz, and ourselves, Pascal and myself, and so we worked to, supposedly together, but as you can guess, not really hand in hand. Um, and we had given back the project, and we were waiting for the observation, and we heard. And the meeting was uh, in September, nearly a year after we were named. And we knew that we were not going to be kept, actually. Because Simone Anglar wrote um, a report which was explaining um, uh, that everything was wrong in our project. Um, on a subjective point of view, it's always easy to distract a project, but hopefully he had been very technical, and so he explained that some of the species of the trees we choose, like uh, we choose to replant some Fraxinus oxycarpa at the end of the terraces on the Place de la Concorde, which is a very chalky and, and um, very dry place. And so he explained to everybody that any Fraxinus would die there. But sadly for him, Axicarpa is a dry, I mean, a dry lover. And not growing, as he said, along rivers. And uh, everything was like that. But everything, when you are talking about plants or technical things with people who don't know, you can, I mean, they, they trust the, the closer. So it was very strong. And it's the first time in my life I've been really biting, but I did. And so he left, actually, the place. And that was not thanks to Mitterrand in that case, because he was closer to him. I was not. Yeah. One more question about Jacques Wirtz's uh, design ideas or design concept, because he has this very unusual way to put this design. But that's Simon in Anglard's work. Exactly. As, as not at the beginning. Absolutely. What was his concept after that if he would have designed the rest of, of, of the Tuileries Garden? Because obviously he wanted to N uh, the fact influence you. What was his no, but he himself was influenced by a text which was written before we worked together by Simon Orgla explaining that the door should be the vagin of the coming and the renaissance of people into the garden and that you should have seven rays because it's Taratata on seven and then, um, and then that the palace should be uh, pools because they would reflect and give back a birth to the two pavilions. Actually, the way the roof of the, the car park is made is a roof and so the pools were like that. So imagine what was the reflection of pools going lower and lower with some swans on it because the swan on in uh, Taratata again on the you born you are born again I mean there all was very symbolic <laughs> and he decided that we should do so and so but we didn't follow but Jacques Wirtz has been following what was given to him, and the result Wirtz has been designing with all those um, interpretation, symbolic interpretation, was not at all what Marx Emmanuel was saying, so everyone was fighting. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it changed the length. Yes. Entirely uh, blocking the view from the lower part of the garden towards the palace. Although I know that, historically speaking, there was a palace before, so you couldn't see anything. But it had been destroyed uh, in 1870, 1871. So, I mean, the space, historically speaking, was, uh, had become a uh, unity. It was all just done with, with this parking and with this tunnel, and in fact, it has made it a 
work, I think, even much more difficult than what it should have been. And that could be the new ditch. I mean, if, he, if Witteron was the keynote keeping that, that sort of ditch around. Yes, but the ditch is a, a hollow, so you don't see it. But it's true that the tunnel was a pain if, we, if people were wishing to create something more adapted to the new space without the palace. And actually what Pei wrote, the, the only indication we had before starting to work for the competition was a letter of Pei saying that he was wishing to see the garden coming into the two arms of the palace and creating a unity in between what was the parterre and the yard of the Cour du Carousel, and that um, the Cour du Carousel should allow uh, sunbays and people like in American University to enjoy their walk in the museum. And uh, so Wirtz uh, uh, um, answered that question, creating his sort of golf course in his first <laughs> version. And we thought that, first of all, it was not really nice to see some bathing people when you're looking at the Poussin. And also, the, the other thing is that, apart from being in France and not really able to maintain properly lawns, uh, there are so many people there that I if the lawns were walked, actually we hoped that our Grand Carré was going to be po uh, walkable. Um, two actors for, I can't remember the figures and I'm unable to remember any number, but there is a lot of people during spring weekends in the garden. Actually all the axis is black of people. You can't see a, gra a bit of, of, of sand yeah, of this dusty soil. Yes. No, we couldn't. No, it would be impossible. Yes, and again, the maintenance in the garden is rather poor. We pushed that the spending could be also on on better tools, and so we have wonderful um, American, I think, mowers, which are broken all the time because they're not really careful about what they have, but everything is really difficult in such places. How much did it cost? Um, our part, 70 million francs. How much did Monsieur Viet's part cost? Oh, don't be nasty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 54. Um, first of all, he's on an artificial soil, and uh, all the ziggurat I was talking were are sort of plastic eggs boxes, empilés. No, it's it's more complicated. Everything is more complicated. There is an amount of use which I can't remember the number, but, but which is uh, more than which is big, <laughs> and. Um, and it's not a part, there is plenty of things to say on the way it was designed and plenty of things to say on how it's going to be used also. What is the verdict to Paris now? Um, yes. No, but the Paris, I mean, the the town of Paris, or people wishing to be mayor tomorrow, <laughs> are rather scared of what it brings on a social point of view, because it's full of um, seringue and, and it's rather complicated to manage. Help me. Yes, it's true, it's true. It is. <laughs> I 
Yes, I don't see Bay alive, excepting any, anything. Could you say again the name of the uh, paper uh, program that allegedly we're followed? I do. It, it was not oh, published. Was it a paper, or what was it? No, it was, it was a written paper by an advisor, but which was totally confidential and internal. I mean, it was not published. It was uh, Maximilien Langlar wrote uh, uh, a way of visiting Les Jardins de Versailles in his way and explaining us how to work there. And that's what you say where it's adapted to in terms of the resulting design? No, I think that Jacques Wirth has been reinterpreting what was given to him as that sort of way to follow. We didn't ourselves but that was a way of creating and he's not respond I mean he was not he was not feeling free we decided that we had to stay free ourselves but that's very we were free of following our way of reading history but not our way of listening to one person deciding for us <laughs> it's finished. <laughs> Monsieur Gatier is he here? Ah, he is. Thank you. Um, as an introduction, I would like to answer to Louis, as we were all impressed by his presentation, but I would like also to develop new ideas about garden, and the new idea I'm trying to develop is conservation. And so I will focus on conservation within the Parc de Saint-Cloud, where, as Louis is also thinking about this topic, we try to understand who was Le Nôtre. And he is, in fact, very unknown. And we try to understand how he did work, not how he did draw, but how he managed to create a landscape. So it means how he dealt with an existing landscape and how he succeeded by creating a total new landscape. So what could be the tools he was using, how he was reacting. So I don't think that we have obviously discovered everything about Le Nôtre, but I think we have improved the knowledge about Le Nôtre in Saint-Cloud. So, you all know Saint-Cloud, it's a um, state property just outside Paris, and compared with the story of the Tuileries, it's, uh, I would say, very 
in one way, very difficult, a very different, excuse me, issue, mainly due to the scale of the property. We have been talking about the numbers of gardeners, so you have 15 gardeners in the Tuileries, so there are 30 in Saint Cloud, and this property is 280, 400, excuse me, 450 hectares, which is something like 1,000 acres with 30 gardeners. And so this garden was set for Monsieur Louis XIV. Wrong buttons. Good one. So Louis XIV's brother and was designed, I would say, by Lenaud, but we should say by a team. And within that team, you have one architect, Le Pautre, one engineer, Thomas Gobert, and one gardener, Le Nôtre. And at the beginning, no one knows what is exactly the shift and who is responsible exactly for what task. And obviously, they were working all together. So what I'm trying to develop this morning, it's just the, the beginning of a process. We are just starting because the Parc de Saint-Cloud was designated as an historical garden in 1994. So it's a rather new idea uh, in France. And since that time, I've been responsible for the renovation of the park. So we are just trying to set the concept of the preservation. So we started a long uh, process divided in three, I would say, three phases. The first phases was to evaluate the state of the trees. The second phase was to improve the historical knowledge of the park and then as a result to make a proposal for this renovation. So the, the first phase is now completed. It has been a two years long uh, program. We, we decided to have a survey, I would say one by one. For each tree has been uh, studied. So we had to deal with 15,000 trees. So it's a program focusing on isolate, isolated trees, line of trees, and also the carré forestier, square of forest, carré forestier, carré forestier. And so this job was done by a team of forest engineers. Most of them have been practicing first in the story of the, the venture of the Tuileries. So the result of this um, survey they told us that we had to cut most of those line of trees. So we have to decide what we were planning to do. So the second phase, which is now going on, is the improvement of the historical knowledge of Le Nôtre project in Saint-Cloud. We had the... Everyone visiting today Saint Cloud is convinced that he is visiting the true Le Nôtre uh, garden without any change. And obviously we had the feeling that things have been largely moved. And mainly in one way is the park has been, I would say, unified. All the differences have been removed, just one species is used for the line of trees, it's Hippocastamus, the marronnier. Mm -hmm. All the alleys have the same typology, it's always double alignement, no more any clearings. 
So the park is totally recovered by vegetation. So trying to understand how did Le Nôtre work is a rather difficult project because he was not rewriting, he was almost not using the drawing as a project tool. There was also this idea that there was no archive left, that everything disappeared with the fire of the castle, who burnt all the Orléans family archives. They were probably shared between Saint-Cloud Castle and the house of the Palais Royal. They both burnt in 1970s, 18, excuse me, 1870s. So there was also this idea that nothing was left. And then what we wanted to do is to have not just, I would say, a mass plan understanding of Le Nôtre project, but I would say a three-dimensional understanding of his job when the only documentation you can find, like the only documentation you can find, it's mainly mass planned, so you don't know what it really looked like. So what, what we did, we start by just, uh, of course, everything is going to be upside down. It took me 10 minutes to notice. Well, so you're going to be to look at. Uh, Can we change that? I'm afraid all of oh. them. I'm not surprised. So I tr just have a look to the next one. Okay, so forward and reverse. So it's the wrong. Let me. Both of them, please. Also, the Capuchin, so if you venture in the Paris suburb, you should try to find a way back. Good, very good. This is Bernard Notary's plan. So, well done. I'm impressed. So, Parc de Saint Cloud, you have here. The river. You have the riverside, a slope, and then the plateau, which turned to be very hilly on the west end of it. So these were bad trees in bad state. Like 
here you have these green layers of clay, green clay, which is a very highly waterproof layer within the soil. And it will appear has to be one of the one of the elements used by all the north I don't know. So, talking about soil, I mean, the park is cut almost in two parts, where you have basic soil, where you will find and on the west part is acid soil, where you will have so it's oak, rope, and it's chestnut. But these are very deep, very good soil, rather typical of the Ile de France uh, area. If you look at the limit of the park, so in green here you have the Parc de saint -Cloud. So it's very difficult hearing you back here. So come here. Excuse me. So this is this green zone is the Parc de Saint Cloud. So you had to deal with its new urban surrounding. The south part of the park, the south limit, the south borders, are almost kept without any change. And it's still a green border with small houses. But along the river, now you have a very heavy traffic road. It's almost a parkway. And on the north part of the park, it has been cut through the old clearings by the Normandy Parkway, which was created in 1936 like uh, a grand projet. And France was very proud of its first parkway that cross the Parc de Saint-Cloud. So, if we try to make a resume of the history of the park, the first phase is what happened previously to Monsieur's arrival in 1658. And so we tried to understand what existed previously. So here you have again the river and we found that there existed a couple of properties, small houses arranged in an Italian way with terraces facing the river. So we were able to locate five houses from the north to the south of the river. And also, we try to find, find out how was the plateau and the slope used previously. Those were agricultural uh, piece of land with cereal, uh, cherry, orchard, and vineyard. So obviously, this was totally, I would say, open without any forest. So that's the first phase. And second phase, when it is bought by Monsieur in 1658, till his death in 1701, just after Le Nôtre death in 1700. The park was developed in two main phases. First, Le Nôtre worked on the part of the park facing the river. And then he developed a larger program on the plateau. And you can see a plan which we were able to date in 1695, which shows the park unfinished, which was then enlarged 
till the end on the west, west end of the park. So first phase here, second phase here, and a third phase over there. So obviously, you will see, we, we have been talking about topography, so you can recognize first how Le Nôtre is dealing with topography. This is the South Stalweg, and here you have the North Stalweg. So the composition of the islets are mainly determined, determined by the topography. But also we tried to find what was the relationship between the pre-existing properties and his creation. So this is one map which is preserved in Robert de Cotte papers which shows Le Bas Parc, it's over there. And you can see old roads from the village of Saint Cloud. And we were able to find the exact limit of the properties. And what appeared is, is that Le Nôtre just reused the previous gardens. So that explains why the Bas Parc is also is so, let's say, complicated, because it's just reusing existing parks. So you have the famous Gondi house here, you have here a Maison du Tillet, you have here fifth, the, the first North house, you have here the Monroe house and Longueuil house. And behind those North houses and South houses, you have agricultural uh, fields, so that were the only place where were created a square of forest. So we had one answer about Le Nôtre's job, I would say, it's reusing. One of the explanations is Monsieur is not Louis the Fourteenth, and he was not as wealthy. So all the Parc de saint Cloud can be explained by this economical issue. So this part of the park is very rich by its, I uh, would say, diversity, diversity. So here you have view of the Bas Parc. So this is the Maison du Tillet. And for example, you can see previous forest reused by Le Nôtre. And what he did is just small new trees that have been just planted. So, and you have the same, this is a bird eye view, and you have here also the same trees, very small trees compared with those preserved mass of forest. And following phase, the early 18th century, with the architect Content d'Ivry, who redesigned just some spot within the park. Here and here, and in this area. And 19th century, Napoleon III just enlarged the park, buying this property on the west end of the domain. And the, the domain de Saint-Cloud today has totally preserved its boundaries, almost the 17th century boundaries enlarged by this property added to the park in the 1850s.
So, um, I would like to focus on Le Nôtre work in the, what we call the Haut Parc. This is called the Bas Parc. This is the Petit Parc, which was kept isolated and directly connected with the castle. And this is the Haut Parc. As I told you, Saint-Cloud today is just a place where everything is the same. It's not a very good vocabulary, but uh, everything is all everywhere in, treated in the same way, designed in the same way. And so what we found, and Frédéric Sichet, who is in my workshop, did this historical researches and he found that Le Nôtre did something which is very, say, articulated with a lot of hierarchy. There was main alleys and secondary alleys. So these are the main alleys. That one from the east to the west, that one and this one. Obviously, Le Nôtre had prepared what we could call a grand project who was never uh, finished. If you look at all those radiating, here you have now the city of Saint-Cloud. If you look at all those radiating alleys, we try to say, continue their drawing and they all meet on this border. So the first element is Le Nôtre, first plan, a big park like this, which was composed with a big square with a main axe. And those structures would be designed and as main alleys. So you have here the drawing. the main alley and here the smaller alley. So these, as I told you, are the main alleys here, here, and all the other one are secondary alleys. How were they planted? The main alleys were planted with double row trees, double alignement, and the secondary alleys were planted with just one alignment. And Deux Alliés d'Argentville is, in his treaty, is describing Les Alliés de Saint-Cloud. He said that there are only two places where you can find that type of alleys. It's in Saint-Cloud and Trianon, and he called them false double row trees alleys. The, you have the planted trees and also what we discovered is those alleys were lined by Char Charmi Bas Carpinus Home Beam. Thank you. So how did we find those charmilles? Through drawings, uh, Frédéric discovered, because as I told you, people say that there is no archive left. In fact, there is many, many things uh, kept uh, somewhere in the Archive National, so you just have to look for and understand what it means exactly. So we found contracts for the cutting of the charmille. We did also, um, very influenced by the British uh, say School of Preservation, archaeological researchers, uh, both excavation and also geophysics, and we, we brought some documentation to geophysic researchers. So we found the diggings of those uh, 
Charmilla. What uh, could be the... I, I will later talk about the clearings, but one of the, the main role, I think, of those clearings was to hide the center within the row of trees, which, as I will show you, were, in fact, never planted. So it's something like a screen. We also tried to analyze the older preserved, we say, structures, structure vegetal. So this is an old Carpinus in the Allée de Versailles. And so you can recognize the line of, the old line of cuttings. This is another picture that shows you all those charm, very close one to the next one. So this is an old charmy bass, totally developed or regrowth, I don't know. So crossing all those informations give you the knowledge of what, what it could be. Um, it, I would like to focus on that methodology. I mean, you just have to cross all the approaches to have the proper answer. And it's not just all the text or the archaeological. It's everything at the same time. So what did exist between those line of trees? At the beginning of our study, in fact, we decided to have this, say, regard or this about Le Nôtre because of this area, which is called Le Bosquet des 24 Arpents, 24 Arpents, that's like acres. So, which remain totally open till the end of the 19th century. So we decided with Frédéric to start our researchers focusing on this area. Why did this clearing existed from the 17th century till the 19th century? I'm not sure that we find the answer. The, the explanation, if we go back to the um, geology explanation, here you have the Grand Reservoir, of, of course this plan is upside down, but you uh, notice it. Thank you, Louis. This is the Grand Reservoir. Okay. And here is the 24 Arpents. So if you superimpose this plan with my green clay, you will see that the green clay is going this way and it has this almost uh, largeur, width. width, thank you. So there is a, obviously a link between the, what, where the Grand Reservoir was set and the uh, geological uh, elements. So we are starting uh, the restoration of the Grand Reservoir. So the Grand Reservoir is directly set on the layers of clay. And my friend uh, Pierre-André Lablaude, I think, found exactly the same thing with the uh, Grand Pièce d'eau in, in Versailles. They were exactly set on the best geological uh, layers. So um, we won't talk today about the, the problem of the water supply in St. Louis, which is one of the main issue. So what I think is this area was kept open to create another reservoir. The, the aqueduct that drive the water from the Ville d'Avray Lake somewhere here, go this way, cross this area, then goes to the Grand Reservoir. So I think that here it was a place supposed to receive a second reservoir. 
But what we know, we have a 1735 description of the Parc de Saint-Cloud. And we were very astonished to discover that just one third of the park was planted. And within this one third, just one fourth of it was planted in haute futé, full growth. Yes? yes? Full growth tree. So just almost nothing planted as a forest. Most of the part, yes, the, the rest of it was the boitaillis, brush wood. Brushwood. And two thirds of the park was kept in clearings. So what happened to those clearings? It was very easy in 1936 to dig a parkway through, through the Parc de Saint-Cloud. So all those clearings were used for the parkway. And those that are not occupied by the parkway, now the forest is just coming back and recovering all those clearings. So it's also a loss of, let's say, emptiness and differences. Um, so now, what are we going to do uh, in Saint-Cloud? We are just, at that time, we are just planning the way we are going to work. The, the first element is we, we will divide the park. This is an 18th century plan, and you show all those clearings. So we are going to divide the park into large areas, and each area will receive its own methodology. So one area is the Bas Parc, which will be divided into a north part and a south part. Why? On the north part you have the cascade. I don't know if I showed you a picture which is a famous hydraulic architectural element kept in the park. So the idea is to improve the historical value of this area. But this could be done only if we reduce the nuisance created by the parkway along the river. And working with the park, it's also dealing with social issues. So this park, the, the lower part of the park, is used for feast, fête foraine, so which is right now set on the north part of the park. So the administrator du domaine, Bernard Notari, is arguing with the mayor of the other city around the park to move down the fête foraine far from the richest part of the park. Then here you have the Petit Parc. So just one, one way about the Petit Parc. Here we have to replant. So this Petit Parc is an evergreen park. And we will, we will try to work in a different way. Here we are replanting. Here we will try just to reshape the old preserved boxes. And here you have gardens. And in this area, that's where Louis Benesch is doing, giving advices for the flowering. And then you have the park itself. So on the Haut Parc, we will have to replant almost all the alleys. So it's a 10 years process that will start um, this winter. So here you have what those alleys look like today and how we will manage. You have to reopen here and clean the borders of the Carré Forestier. Then we will replant young trees and redo the Charmille. So there, is, there was one 
big discussion about the choice of species. We found in the documentation that all the park was planted, which is rather common in France, with orme, and you know, elm trees dying by the graffios. So even if there are some cultivar today, it's impossible It's impossible to replant 15,000 trees and trees. So we had to find what kind of species we were going to select. So at that point, obviously, the project is no more, I would say, an historical, I would say, restitution. It's something different because we can't reuse the original species. So what we decided is to go through the 17th century list, usually used in the Nôtre parks, and to select a couple of them. We wanted to improve the diversity, the vegetal diversity, and we select two species for the, and we wanted also to deal with this hierarchy that was created by the Nôtre. So we choose one species for the main alleys and another species for the secondary alleys. So for the main alleys, Platanus orientalis, and for the secondary alleys, uh, Tilia cordata, which is a Tilia de forêt, which was very common at that time. There was also a debate, and I guess you have the same thing, the Tuileries, about the path, what is the distance between two trees. There was a big argument in the Commission Supérieure des Monuments Historiques, and we, we wanted to preserve the very uh, narrow way of planting trees, and it was accepted. So the trees are going to be replanted exactly where they are planted today with the same distance between two of them. About the charmille, um, we have been talking this morning about gardeners. So the idea that we share with Bernard Notari is to redevelop the work of the gardeners. Uh, even if it's designed this way, there is a habit in the French parks, state park probably. All the trees are cut, I say, taille architecturée with a regular shape. So you have kilometers of trees that are cut. So you've seen in the 17th century painting that all those trees have, were planted in forme libre, in free, free shape. So we will reintroduce this way of developing trees. So we, we had an economical discussion that with the economy we are doing in not doing the straight cutting, we will be able to pay for the horn beam. And the second idea is the horn beam will be done in a very we say, mechanized w way by the gardeners of the Domaine de Saint-Cloud, which are attracted by, I would say, new uh, tasks. I think it's almost the end. Uh, this was some views of the Parc Réservé, this area where you have all those box trees and most of them are preserved, but it's this way today. So we will work with those remnants and try to reshape all those salvertes. So the idea is to have two types of project. In the Haut Park, we have to replant and recreate. Here we will just reuse the existing and preserved um, everlasting plants to recreate um, 
some structures. These are other views of the Petit Parc with all the Hippocastamus, which is planted almost everywhere. So these are the two last uh, pictures. Um, it's um, historical uh, understanding of a park is obviously not enough to deal with uh, 1,000 acres park, which was in the 17th century within, let's say, a natural landscape and now totally surrounded by Paris uh, suburbs. We are trying to deal with uh, car and with the traffic, which is one of the main uh, problems because people use the park to get to, to Paris in the morning to, to avoid the traffic on the parkway. So you have a lot of cars, so you uh, can see what it creates. So we don't have any solution. Uh, so we have, there is a lot of pressure outside the park by the mayor to keep the traffic through the park. So now it's a political um, decision till now to maintain the traffic through the park. The, the idea to recreate the clearings is also a way to deal with the occupation of the park. Most of the visitors are all gathering around the nicer areas. So what we, we want to do is to create some open field where people could move and reduce the pressure on the main um, areas. Another element of thinking is we will do some, in a way, historical uh, reconstitution, restitution of the two types of alleys. But we need also to use the modern creation. Um, there is some areas where 17th century park is facing, I would say, the new um, suburbia, the parkway, and I don't think that the historical garden can offer an answer to this uh, contact between those two different spaces, I mean, the park and the parkway. So we are in fact preparing like, like a mass plan where are located areas where uh, modern paysagists will have to help us to treat those uh, screen or space separating the park and its uh, surrounding. And um, so as I told to Louis, I think uh, preservation is a brand new idea. <laughs> Thank you. It's no more a 17th century garden. It was redesigned in the 18th century and <coughs> reshaped in the 19th century. So what, w what we asked, we say, we want to have more time to work on the Petit Parc and to select between those two historical 
even if we have to select, I don't know. The idea is to keep as much as we can. And north of it, you have Le Jardin du Trocadéro, where Louis Benesch is improving the flowering. So this is a marvelous 1820s uh, park, and obviously it has to be kept as a 19th century garden. So the idea is uh, Saint-Cloud is, say, a patch of different elements of the history of gardens, and you, we, are, we are just trying to re reassemble, re shape with everything. Um, d can I have the first slide, please? The first slide. Yes. Thank you. This is the cascade. Okay. So ju just, uh, I'm not answering the question, but one point about history of gardens. So you remember that, so we are in the Bas Parc, the cascade is by Le Pautre, and La Grande Poile is by Ardouin Mansart. And it was bordered by two square of forest here that you saw in the 17th century painting by van der Meulen. In the 18th century, it was replaced by a quinconce, so it's rows of tilia cordata. And it was supposed to be open and to one day to improve and said to be historical feeling, they, in front of this, this uh, quinconce, they planted a charmille. So this is a 17th century element, and this is an 18th century element, so it, it doesn't work. So but that's not the... Okay, so we are, we are back to the mass plan of Saint-Cloud today. So I have the feeling that I'm almost able to renovate, I would say, not the park, but a space within the border. So this is the river, this is the parkway. So I have the feeling that using history of gardens tools, we can do something here. But I don't know how I can make those connections. You have the parkway and the main alleys. So this area used to be the clearings area. So what happened? All those clearings are now occupied. They were built. You have hospitals, you have stadium, you have here the parkway. So we have to create a, a transition, a space that is the tr transition between the historical park and the modern uh, city. We have also to deal with this parkway. So in each official meeting, I'm asking for this parkway to be underneath, but uh, people told me that in uh, 1999 it's impossible to pay for this uh, modification. So we have to create, invent something like a screen that will separate the Bas Park from the parkway. What happened since the creation of this avenue, the, pa the, the Bas Park which, as you noticed, was developed since the 16th century with very prestigious small garden reshaped by Le Nôtre, has totally, we say, um, been abandoned. So 
even if with Bernard Notari we are dreaming to improve the quality of this space, it will, be, it will have any sense only if we are able to isolate the Bas Park from the parkway. And also, and the Bernard Notari almost succeeded one week ago by moving all the activities set here in the south part of the park here. But would that mean you screen off the, the view to the, to the river? Do so, no, that's a um, very big question because I, I showed you the 17th century picture which is somewhere So the park was totally open to the river and most of the images, representation, are showing the park seen from the other bank. So this is the view of the park. The castle is, I think, here. And it was totally open to the river it's like uh, la promenade des Tuileries and now the parkway is higher than the park um, we, I don't know what we are supposed to do do we have to close the park and separate it from the nuisance of the parkway do we have to keep this original view which has which have today no sense. I mean, uh, you, you talk about the Rue de Rivoli, I mean, it's almost the same uh, uh, problematic. Uh, but I still think that uh, we have to accept, I mean, what I will say, it's always, uh, it's quite uh, evident. That we have to accept the idea that Saint Cloud now is in a 20th century surrounding and we have to deal with it. We can't just go back to a dream of a, a nice 17th century, it's just uh, finished. Was Saint Cloud originally used as a hunting park for Monsieur, or did he, was he not hunting there? Um, no, Monsieur was a very fine man. I be, I'm a Parisian and I'm a non hunting, uh, excuse me for this. <laughs> and so I share with Monsieur, that's the only thing I share with him. So he, <clears throat> he was a very uh, cultivated man, he was a very brilliant collector, and all his uh, castle, chateau, is organized with all the cabinet uh, looking on the broderie. He was not hunting. He was using his park, and we have description with all the animals uh, in the clairière and everywhere. So we are trying to understand what was the use of those open space. So I showed you one map where you have inscription. This one here. You have each time it's described if it's Labour, or Prairie, uh, pra uh, Labour, Prairie, Emmanuel? Yes. Yeah, so we can understand how it was used. It was almost an agricultural uh, landscape. And this use just went on because in the 19th century, all this clearing area was used, uh, like uh, Ara, horse breeding area. Uh, what is the date of that plan? Uh, Frédéric? Please. What is the date of that plan, Frédéric? Uh, 1735. 1735, c'est Legrand. Is there any old house left to give you a bit of focus for your perspective and is it left for the old construction? Almost, uh, almost nothing was left. So the castle burnt by 1870 or 71. It's a big issue because uh, who did burn the castle? Was it the Germans or the French commune? Who knows? Yes, so there was a political decision in 1891. Because it was a commune? Yes, they were very efficient. Huh? They burnt almost five or... Yes, yes. So. 
Now, th there is a, an, an interesting uh, political story. It was decided to or to demolish the remnants of the royalty or to move the property to, we say, des organismes scientifiques, scientific um, organizations. So all the building were destroyed or they were moved to scientific organization. And the same thing happened to all those royal properties. The castle of Meudon was moved to the Observatoire, Observatoire de Paris. You mean it was given to them? Yes. So it was partly kept. In Saint-Cloud, the castle found and no reuse was found. So the castle was destroyed. The, the um, service building, les, les bâtiments de commun, service building, were given to the Ecole Normale. I mean, so they are preserved. And we found that one of those buildings was built by Le Pôtre. So we have something kept. And here you have a pavillon de Breteuil, and he was given to the uh, Convention du Maître, the Meta International Convention. So it's an interesting story. It was all removed or given to a scientific organization. And on the west part of the building, you had a 19th century, very interesting garden called Villeneuve, which is uh, Premier Empire, First Empire, Galden for Napoleon uh, Maréchal Soult. And it was given to Pasteur for uh, reuse. Okay. So now there is a, a process to move back the property of those uh, kept building back to the park. Well, I think yeah, I have to A uh, possibly best known archaeologist in this field, coming to talk to you about what he has been doing himself personally here and in France. And this is a keynote speech as far as we're concerned, because we believe that archaeology is the thing that we are most directed now in the course of our conservation. Brian. Okay. Uh, but before that, I want to. Okay, can I start now? <laughs> right, thanks. Um, I suppose it seems a bit strange that there should be an English person standing up talking about archaeological work in a French garden. Uh, but the reality is that there hasn't been very much garden archaeology undertaken in France. And that was why it was all the more heartening to hear Pierre Antoine and to actually listen to a very new approach um, that seems to be being adopted in France towards the study of historic gardens uh, and their related landscapes. In fact, the way in which I became involved was largely by default. 
Uh, I think it was pretty much a cosmetic exercise, paying lip service to this newfangled thing called garden archaeology. Uh, and it related to the proposed restoration of a Renaissance garden, which I'll come on to um, for, the, for the core of what I'm going to say today. Um, but the reality was that the architect en chef had already, through his office, drawn up considerable, or considerably detailed plans for the recreation, I think is the right word, um, of this particular uh, mid-16th century garden. Uh, some very limited and very, very unsatisfactory archaeology was undertaken by a local amateur group uh, with very, very narrow trenches, which the large size of the director of excavations, um, or his large size, meant that he couldn't actually descend into these trenches. Um, <laughs> Because they were so narrow, they penetrated all the important archaeology and started to, um, to intrude into underlying geological layers. Uh, and the whole thing was considered very, very unsatisfactory. Uh, and the architect on chef was told, I think, in no uncertain terms, that, yes, you ought to be doing some, some archaeology, but for God's sake, do it properly. Uh, and I don't know whether it did end up being done properly, but that's where I came into the, into the picture. And at my very first meeting with the architect on chef, um, unfortunately I'd got an interpreter with me because my schoolboy French wasn't really up to sort of a lot of what he was, was telling me. Um, his very first official words were, Monsieur, je suis un fonctionnaire. Uh, he then proceeded to sort of to explain to me uh, and impress me with um, all the diplomas, certificates and other qualifications that he'd obtained. Uh, and the examinations and interviews that he'd had to go through to, to get his job. Immediately after that, uh, he took me on this tortuous course at breakneck speed, uh, like a TGV, straight through all the, the legislation. Uh, I was left sort of completely bewildered. But this was a foretaste, in fact, of some rather na nasty internecine strife that existed between the Monument Historique and the Service Régional Archaeologie. Uh, and I found myself at various times caught in the middle, um, being taken to one side and various whisperings made in my ear uh, as to what line I should pedal. Um, but the line that I've pedalled all the way through and will continue to pedal and will pedal this morning, or perhaps I should say this afternoon now, um, is very much something that is in favour of the integrity of the site and the, and the archaeology of the site. And to me, that's what's important. Not the, not the politics. I accept that there will be politics. There are just as bad political wranglings and just as bad mistakes made in this country. They're made worldwide. But what is important is a protection and a proper recognition of the fragility and the vulnerability of the archaeological heritage, the archaeological resource and the historical fabric of those gardens. Of course, it's quite common for us here in England now to use archaeology as, as a tool of conservation management, and in particular in, in relation to garden recreation projects or reconstruction projects. Um, and I thought it would be of interest, just very briefly, to explore some of the issues, not in my native tongue but in somebody else's, uh, before actually turning to talk in English um, uh, about the work that I've been doing at Valerie. So if we could perhaps have the... First slide, please. Mesdames et Messieurs, les méthodes archéologiques, la prospection systématique et la fouille peuvent remettre au jour les traces de jardins abandonnés depuis longtemps et identifier les étapes de développement de ceux toujours utilisés. Un examen minutieux des vestiges subsistantes étayé par l'étude de documents d'archives et l'analyse biologique, peut révéler l'étendue et la nature des jardins disparus et apporter des indications sur leur développement chronologique. Des détails spécifiques aux anciens tracés et aux plantations d'origine peuvent être mis au jour par le sondage ou la fouille programmée qui, de nos, nos jours, sont devenus essentiels à toute restitution ou restauration qui se veut précise ou fidèle. L'archéologie des jardins a répondu à ce désir d'exactitude en procurant des éléments d'information de plus en plus précis 
Elle offre la possibilité de vérifier directement les méthodes anciennes de préparation du sol, ainsi que la nature des matériaux de, de, de construction d'origine. Elle permet aussi de faire un relevé précis des emplacements d'arbres et autres traces d'un management horticultural. Enfin, elle rend possible la reconstitution des anciens profils topographiques, des allées et des éléments architecturaux meilleurs. L'archéologie offre un entrée quadruple. Premièrement, son apport à la restauration des jardins et aux travaux de reconstruction qui l'accompagnent est indéniable. Deuxièmement, elle possède une valeur scientifique intrinsèque, soit quand elle établit le potentiel d'un site, ou quand elle cherche à définir et décrire ses découvertes à, à des fins purement académiques. Troisièmement, les renseignements qu'elle apporte sont indiscutables indiscutablement fondamentaux à tout travail d'interprétation et ils peuvent être utilisés soit pour élaborer une série de dessins reconstructifs ou pour retracer un jardin sur le terrain. Son quatrième entrée réside dans la contribution qu'elle apporte à l'anthropologie culturelle, les traces fossiles du contexte politique, économique et social peuvent être retrouvées. As I was saying, <laughs> in England we have come, become used to using archaeology um, as a, a means of providing accurate information uh, regarding the layout of features that we then carry forward into design plans for the restoration or reconstruction of individual gardens. But at the same time, we have a very long tradition of field archaeological observation, which has an important or is an important tool of wider conservation issues which we can use the archaeological techniques of observation and analysis to identify historic garden and other landscape features that are worthy of preservation and protection not simply to to go around hither and thither reconstructing them and it was interesting to me that Pierre Antoine touched upon the analysis uh, at Saint Cloud of the historic fabric, the, 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 the historic tree planting, and looking not just at the sort of the disposition of trees, but actually looking at the structure of the individual trees from the point of view of the identification of scars, which might betray for, uh, former techniques of management and so on. And that is a, a increasingly an, an aspect that archaeologists are turning to in this country as well. But of course, we're also looking in places where trees once existed but have long disappeared and where there may still be surface evidence, either in the form of very slight earthworks, humps or, or hollows um, in, the, in uh, a parkland surface, or the sites of individual trees uh, may still be marked by vegetational differences. But I suppose the thing that we're maybe most fam familiar with through the techniques of field archaeology are the earthwork remains of park boundaries, for example, which could have involved quite substantial ditch digging, in some instances uh, as here in Kensington Gardens, to create a boundary ha-ha that, when originally constructed in the early years of the 18th century, was some eight feet deep, uh, and it's now largely backfilled. Um, this has been given a little bit of a helping hand uh, by modern archaeology to emphasise the bastion feature uh, that was created at this particular point. But there are other sunken features, and here's the remains of uh, a large originally water-filled basin uh, that occupies a, a central position on a, a flight of terraces uh, in a, a, the remains of a late uh, 17th or early 18th century garden. And then there are the remains of the built features, where earth has been cast up to create terraces, as in this terrace uh, in the Fellows Garden at Wadham College uh, in Oxford. And all of these demand and repay, 
careful study and, and, and analysis. And it's quite possible because some of those garden features can be well dated that we can construct a, a typology and we can apply information that we've learned from one site uh, to the analysis and understanding of another. But all of these features have a fragility and in some instances by laying them bare we open them to erosion by encouraging visitors to, uh, to clamber upon them uh, we can also accelerate changes in the existing form. But archaeology has also developed techniques of seeing below the soil, non-intrusive investigation, where um, perhaps there are no upstanding remains and there are no immediately visible features on the surface. And there are several geophysical techniques that can be applied. And in this particular instance, we see a resistivity survey being undertaken uh, at Hatfield House uh, with the aim of loca locating the former layout of paths and associated flower beds. Equally successful is the complementary technique of magnetometry and one can even use ground penetrating radar to see beneath tarmac surfaces. The results obviously uh, arrive in an electronic digital form but computer software programs are available to translate them to a, a, a graphic printout, as in this particular example, where um, the, in striking detail, the plat bond of former flower beds uh, in William III's privy garden of 1701 to 1702 can be seen. This is vital information, not just for the purposes of going ahead with a restoration project, but actually identifying a site constraint where one may need to think very carefully about the impact of proposed redevelopment uh, upon remains that seem to be as well preserved as this. And then of course there is the physical investigation of those remains. The digging of sondage, trenches, to open up and to investigate the precise character and nature of the underlying structures. And in this way, it's quite possible to reveal entire flower beds, as well as the remains of paths and features of the hard landscape, such as the foundations of, of steps uh, and uh, the layout of, of drains and so on. All of this means that you have an exact fix upon the location of these former features. You also have a precise knowledge of the materials that were used in their construction. It means that if you wish to proceed with a reconstruction, or for that matter, if you are simply undertaking more general research, you've got quality, accurate, reliable, indisputable information. But of course, it isn't simply um, the investigation of features such as steps or fountains, for that matter, one can actually look and find the remains of very intricate flower bed arrangements, as in this example from Castle, Castle Bromwich. But the point is that everything has a fragility about it, that it, it, it was, is so very easily disturbed, and that excavation by itself um, is inevitably part of that, or part of a destructive process. So it should not be undertaken lightly, and perhaps we need to think very, very carefully before we proceed with recreating many of our historic gardens. Well, as I was saying, I came in a little bit sort of late on the scene, perhaps, uh, in relation to the work that I've been doing in France. Um, and that work's taken place at a, place, uh, at, at a site in Valerie, which lies towards the northwest tip of modern Burgundy. In fact, I've been working there since 1996, and Valerie itself can be found about 19 kilometers to the west of Sens, in the canton of Chiawa, uh, and the village itself occupies both sides of the valley slopes uh, of the River Orvan. Uh, the Orvan itself rises from the River Loing uh, and uh, joins the Seine close to, to, to Fontainebleau. Well, a castle existed at Valerie right from uh, early on in the Middle Ages. 
but it was partly reconstructed towards the middle years of the 16th century for the um, Maréchal de Saint-André, Jacques Dalbon. And the architect was no less a person than Pierre Lesco, who had also worked on part of the Louvre. And it's quite obvious that the gardens were laid out at the same time. And it may very well be that, that, that he was responsible for, for those also. There are surviving works accounts from the years 1554 to 1556, which detail payments being made to plumbers and carpenters, who at that time were busy constructing pavilions uh, and assisting with other works uh, in the, the main garden, the Jardin d'Agrement, uh, which in actual fact was an enclosed garden that lies in the valley towards the, the, the base of the, um, uh, of the chateau. So this is just a, a detail of, of some of Lesko's work on the chateau. And here we can see the, the north wall uh, of the Jardin d'Agrement with the chateau rising on the hill slope beyond. Uh, the chateau itself has been much altered since its original construction in the, uh, the mid-16th century. Um, it lost uh, one of its wings in the 18th century when the then owner, Mademoiselle de Sens, uh, caused this, this part of the structure to be demolished uh, and made a gift of the materials to her uncle, who was the uh, local cardinal archbishop. Then in the 19th century, the top story of the building uh, was removed and replaced by the present roof. Of the gardens themselves, um, they have similarly sort of uh, suffered changes, uh, not the least of which uh, was their conversion, according to a, a sale catalogue from the middle years of the 18th century, their conversion to, um, to allotment grounds and, and orchards. In fact, there were two potagers in the Jardin d'Agrement and in an adjacent larger garden, the former Lonai or older ground, um, an orchard was established. But the central features of, of each garden, uh, comprising two great canals, together with their surrounding or boundary walls, um, have continued to dominate the valley bottom right through to the present day, though obviously sort of becoming very, very choked and overgrown. So that last slide was, was a, of the canal in the Lonai, and this is looking across um, part of the Jardin d'Agrement uh, with this large ornamental basin uh, at its centre. Well, as a result of excavation, some rather important remains were found. Not, bits, not scraps of pottery, and not um, what I'm just about to mention, not actually fragments of, of structure relating to the garden, but rather microscopic pollen, snail remains, uh, and some other plant remains. And these came from, or, um, and were preserved, in various levels of soil beneath the surface. And the material that came from the original ground surface below the garden soils, and in, that, in fact beneath the base of, of many of the related architectural features. Analysis of them shows that the area was previously damp and marshy, with frequent flooding. And it's quite obvious that the, the water regime needed to be controlled and that the area needed to be, be dried out. Clearly having a great sort of bog in the valley bottom was, was an important feature of defence in depth to the medieval castle. But once you move towards the Renaissance chateau, uh, a, 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 a fine building that you're expecting people to come and visit you in, um, the last thing you actually want them to do is to arrive uh, over some, some bog. <laughs> so how did they control the water regime? Well, basically they constructed a dam to create a reservoir upstream. And then that reservoir connected by, by a series of drainage cha channels or, or other canals or aqueducts. It connected with the, um, the main canal in the Jardin d'Agrement and then with a series of other waterworks further downstream. And all this, in fact, made possible some use of the otherwise inhospitable land. Well, the area of the reservoir had become pasture by 1737, as is shown in contemporary maps. And it has remained farmland right through to the present day, um, with the exception of a narrow strip at the base of the dam, uh, 
uh, which was metal for use as a road during the 19th century. The southern edge of it has been modified by new waterworks, uh, again probably of a, uh, an 18th to 19th century date, but the northern edge is still marked by a steep scarp where the valley slope was previously cut, cut away or quarried out. The river or van, which previously was directed through the reservoir and then through the canals uh, running down the middle of the garden, the axial canals, that's nowadays directed along a fairly straight channel in the southern part of the valley floor where the end of the dam has been truncated at the, the sort of far end just in front of, of, of the house uh, in this slide. And this is what the end of that dam looks like as partially excavated. And we can see that the dam itself has been made up of carefully laid and trampled or rammed down uh, layers of soil and chalk and clay. But it's been rather rudely cut off uh, at the right-hand end uh, of, of this view, uh, and a small, world, uh, small wall was probably inserted. And we certainly found out evidence that the last two and a half metres uh, of the dam had, had been sort of remodelled. But the dam itself is a, an extremely impressive structure. It still stands largely intact, almost four metres high, and it's at least 136 metres long. The investigation of the structure and its retaining walls, together with related mortar analysis, has shown that it was, its construction was coeval with the creation of the gardens in the mid-16th century. In fact, they couldn't have made the gardens without doing something with the water problem. The dam itself had been formed by dumping material at either side of a clay core. And the clay core is just visible, um, making an appearance in the bottom left-hand corner of this particular view. But the hole was held in place with strong outer walls almost 20 metres apart. And the wall facing the reservoir was built upon an oak spreader plate which rested above a series of older piles that had been driven into the underlying marsh to provide a stable footing. And the opposite wall beside the main garden, the Jardin d'Agrement, um, was probably similarly supported to prevent sinking. And as we'll see, hopefully, uh, in, in a moment, was strengthened by a series of massive counterforts. Well, the walls themselves seem to have been built initially uh, as if they were freestanding. But as their height increased, so the space between them was progressively infilled. And at the core, at the centre of, uh, of, of the dam, a mass of firm plastic yellowish-brown clay was rammed between shuttering to form a strong, impermeable heart up to three metres wide. And then at either side, the substance of the dam was built up, as we can see here, of successive tips of clay, earth, and chalk rubble. Well, the way in which the top surface was finished off can no longer be identified due to later disturbance. Not anything that had happened in the 18th or the 19th century, but clearance in the early 1990s, following the cutting down uh, of um, some venerable lime trees uh, that had probably been planted on the top uh, at some point towards the end of the 18th century. However, whilst that disturbance, the modern disturbance, had sheared off the top of the dam. In the final stages of its construction, there have been widespread layers of chalk and compacted small chalk rubble, forming a, a uniform base, almost like a, a thick white blanket uh, over the, the, 